this video, I want to talk about the concept of wicked problems, something that's very important to legal researchers. Because in the real world, problems don't come with nice, easy sets of answers like tutorial problems. And one of the jobs of the researcher is to actually get to the nub of a problem and to actually understand how to solve a problem where there isn't a fixed and set answer. Now, the term wicked problems um, came from a couple of uh, theorists called Rittle and Weber who worked in the field of social planning. And they became aware that suddenly the problems that they were facing were large and complex and messy and uh, were not as easy to solve as people in the field of social planning had thought previously. And of course the term has become used generally uh, across different disciplinary fields now. And we realise that most of the problems that we face as a society fit into this category of wicked problems. And one of the examples that is often given is, of course, global warming as something that there isn't one simple, straightforward answer to. Now, their definition of a wicked problem said required that there were several features. Uh, the first was that it's open-ended, uh, that it's a problem that doesn't have a nice, easy solution uh, that you can resolve the problem with one step. Uh, the problem is complex. It's a problem that has no universal solution. You might be required to use different strategies in different places. There is a need for a flexible result. This is something that's uh, confounding for lawmakers, as law tends to approach all problems as something you know that has one result. The idea of equality before the law is you have one legal tool and you apply it in all situations. And the other thing that they identified was that uh, uh, a wicked problem is connected to other problems. It doesn't just sit by itself uh, as a solution. Uh, there's a whole interconnected ecology of problems and sometimes when you think you're doing well to solve one problem, you're actually creating more problems elsewhere. So this concept of, of, of wicked problems, I think, is something to consider and to think about, and particularly as you progress through your studies and you move from the early period where there's a lot of hand-holding and you're told Here's a scenario, how do you solve the scenario? Here you go, it's a nice easy answer. Uh, you look up the book and it says that there's, there's this solution. To actually looking at the real sorts of issues that real professionals face. Because the simple problems are usually the ones that people can solve for themselves. The wicked problems are the ones that require specialist use. An example of a wicked problem that comes from within the law field uh, that's a useful one for us to think about is the drug problem and the drug regulation problem. Now, one way, when you think about wicked problems, you may think, well, aren't all problems like that? Isn't this stating the obvious? But the old way that we used to think about solving problems was a linear approach. It was a very simple approach. And the drug problem is a classic example of how that was done. Drugs are a problem. What will we do? We'll create a punishment. And the punishment will deter people from becoming drug users. Uh, oh, it's not working. What will we do? We'll increase the punishment. And under that sort of linear model, the more punishment and the more severe a punishment you apply, obviously the less people will use drugs because they'll be you know, deterred by the fear of punishment. Now that simply does not work. It didn't work in the 19th century and it certainly hasn't worked uh, through the 20th and into the 21st century. Uh, this is a problem that you can't find simple solutions to. And part of the problem is the idea of deterrence is something which we have found is, is, is not very effective. There's been a lot of work in criminology and penology around deterrence and while we find there's a sort of a threshold deterrence that most people, if something is criminal, uh, will be deterred and say, well, I won't do that because I might get in trouble. But once you get into people who are actually having an offender's behaviour, um, then deterrence doesn't really work the way you think it does. And it's for a lot of reasons and particularly in the area of, of drug addiction and drug use, um, you've got problems that are not r about rational decisions. About It's not where someone says, well, I could go and get some heroin today, but I'll sit down and I'll think about it. Now, rationally, I might get caught and I might get punished for it, so I'll weigh that up very carefully. There's lots of reasons, addiction not being an inconsequential part of that, but there's also issues of poverty, and there's also issues of, in the people's background, um, not seeking to generalise, but a lot of severe addicts have problems with poverty and abuse in their backgrounds. And those are sort of things that are not conducive necessarily to making uh, rational decisions. And there's a lot of more recent work in criminology around risk-taking behaviour as well. Uh, that generally speaking, a lot of 
uh, criminal activity across the board can be accounted for through the uh, uh, aspect of risk-taking and risk-taking behaviour rather than necessarily rational deterrence. So as we move from the old um, linear model where we say, well, we'll just punish people more and then we'll have less crime, we actually realise that the problem is quite complex. And as far as wicked problems go, this is one that's reasonably easy to monitor because we've got things like crime rates and sentencing figures and things that we can actually look and plot over time and we can actually see the changes. Something like global warming, much more difficult to actually get the, the, the numbers. But in terms of drug and crime rates, it's, more, it's something that we can actually look at more closely. So what do we do um, if we've run out of the idea of just putting people in jail for longer? And particularly, you'll see in the United States, uh, this has had a, dead of de have a devastating effect on some sections of the community where there are large numbers of, uh, usually men, um, in that community who are, um, who are in jail for long periods of time because of increasingly harsh drug laws. Uh, so what do we do about it? Well, this is not the place to go through in this in detail, but around the world there have been measures that have been taken that have been more successful. So things like drug courts, community neighbourhood justice centres, um, medical intervention and use of things like safe injecting rooms, trying to manage the, the things that are, that are driving the addiction, trying to manage the poverty or abuse um, that, 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 that a person has suffered that may lend them towards, uh, push them towards addiction. Or better yet, maybe stopping the poverty and abuse happening in the first place to actually stop people in the future becoming addicts. So there's a whole raft of different approaches, and these are things that have been reasonably effective, and we actually see that through effects on the conviction rates. Um, we actually see a, a positive effect, a, a decreasing of drug conviction rates where some of these strategies are used. So this, I think, I think is a good example of uh, how you can solve a wicked problem or at least move towards a solution of a wicked problem by using lots of different strategies, by being flexible, by trying to use different interconnected strategies and to actually match uh, and, and map what happens when a particular intervention occurs. When, you know, sometimes, you know, decriminalisation solves a particular area or issue around uh, drug crime but then creates other problems around it. So this is, this is a, a great example to think about, but most of the examples of the things that we look at around law are wicked problems. They have all these different multifactored uh, components, but they're not so easy to, and then, which makes them not so easy to solve by just applying a simple solution. You know, fine people, punish them, put them in jail, whatever, doesn't actually solve those problems. Now, the other thing to note about the solutions to uh, wicked problems is that they're interdisciplinary, interprofessional, and interagency. They're inter inter everything. So they're not just about one particular discipline. Lawyers can't just say, "Well, we're lawyers. We know all about legal problems. We're not going to listen to anyone else." Uh, similarly, interprofessional. We've got groups like law and medicine working together, and interagency. You need co cooperation between government bodies and public organisations, uh, welfare bodies, uh, charities, all working together to solve a lot of these problems. And the problem of the past is we've tended to work in silos. We've tended to put one organisation in charge and we've said, oh, you're, you're the organisation in charge of drugs. You're the organisation in charge of family violence. You're the organisation in charge of whatever. Um, and then you solve that problem. And the, this new era has required a lot of cooperation across the board. So it's a very interesting emerging era. It's something that even in the last 10 years, there's been massive advances in theory and different tools to approach it. I'll put a link in the notes on this video, but uh, the Australian Public Service Commission has actually embraced the idea of solving wicked problems, and they have quite an interesting discussion of some of these problems, and I really recommend you have a look at that. It's not very long, it's got a very interesting discussion. The other part of it, of course, is there's a whole lot of theory that has started to emerge around complexity theory, uh, how problems are interconnected and how forms of intervention require an understanding of, of complex systems. And I'll also put a link in the notes below to complexity labs, which is a very interesting website. It's an organisation that um, does a lot of work in complexity theory, in things like system design, network theory, non-linear systems, emergent behaviour, game theory, all this kind of stuff that you sort of think, well, how does this apply to me as a lawyer? Well, these are the kind of 21st century skills that you're going to require 
as a legal researcher, whether your problems are dealing with big social problems for you know society or dealing with a small problem that a smaller problem that a client's facing and understanding why a particular client's problem is in the shape that it is. So I recommend the Complexity Labs work website. It has articles, it has really good videos, um, and even sort of short courses that you can do in understanding complexity theory. So wicked problems are something that are not going to go away, obviously. It's something that there's a real drive, particularly in the field of employment, that having people who understand and have strategies for dealing with wicked problems are going to be incredibly employable. Whereas if you come along with your basic tool set that says, well, I'm just going to approach a problem the way everyone has in the past, uh, you're going to be less employable and definitely less appealing to employers as um, someone who actually has thought about these issues and has actually, of their own volition, started to look into this field and started to, to, to gather skills for themselves. And it's a field where creativity and innovation are very important. And creativity is not just about, you know, sticking a pretty picture on something so it looks nicer. Creativity is about um, actually understanding problems in new and different ways and making connections, um, following different different uh, chains of ideas, uh, bringing people and organisations together across those old boundaries. So there you go, wicked problems. It's something that makes the world uh, more complicated, but it's also, I think, uh, in this particular point in time, something that's very important for legal researchers to know about, to think about, and to start building their skills around because it's going to be something that, that's going to be very, very important to practice in the 21st century.